All right, our attendees are popping in. Welcome everyone. Hello, hello. So good to see everyone. Also, apologies if I look awkward looking up and down. I'm currently operating on two monitors, so you might see that I am looking up at times to manage the PowerPoint. I think you look great. <laughs> We're all here. It's a wonderful <laughs> evening. I'm so thrilled that everyone is here. Welcome. Um, on the right hand side, I, I believe uh, you can chat in if you could just chat in your name and where you're where you're coming in from, where you're tuning in from. We'd love to see uh, all the diversity of places people are coming from or listening in. Kelly, Eastern North Carolina. Los Angeles. All right. Boston College. I'm an Eagle too. Canada, San Francisco. New York. From the Bronx, I spent some time there teaching um, at an activity called uh, at a nativity school called um, Saint Ignatius. My first, in Los Angeles. my first job after high school, before college, was at a was like doing filing for a physical therapy clinic in the South Bronx. In the South Bronx, that's awesome. Yeah, seventeen-year-old Margaret. My first, my first job was also volunteer work with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, um, where I was living in Harlem and working in the Bronx. It was really very, very cool. Yeah. Teaching sixth grade social studies. Who doesn't love learning about ancient Egyptians and the pyramids? It was so much fun. Well, I think you'll have a lot of folks in this crowd who will agree. <laughs> We have a pretty sizable crowd tonight, 17 participants thus far. It's pretty awesome. Thanks all for tuning in. We'll probably give it about another minute before we get started. I think we could get started. Sure, let's do it. All right, everybody, welcome to the application breakdown. My name is, um, well, we'll get to introductions in a second, but I'm Margaret Okadashek. And this is on the Statement of Purpose Project Proposal for the Master of Religion and Public Life Program and the Writing Sample, which are all components of the application for admission for entrance in fall 2022. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Margaret Okadashek. I am an Associate Director of Admissions. I've been at HDS Admissions for about uh, three years now, um, and I'm originally from Queens, New York. And Hi, I everyone. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. My name is Alessandra Ludeking, and I'm the Admissions Officer here at Harvard Divinity School, and I've been with the team for just a little over five months but I was initially an admissions assistant and admissions officer at Harvard Law School in 2018. So I've definitely seen my fair share of applications and I'm really excited to be here today offering you our tips and insights on a statement of purpose, the project proposal and the writing sample. Before we dig in too deeply, I just wanna say, I'm gonna disable the chat feature shortly and really encourage you to ask us any questions that you might have with the Q&A chat box. And for today, we're gonna to be focusing in specifically on the statement of purpose, the project proposal and the writing sample. So I do kindly ask that you feel free to type in your questions pertaining to those three application components. If you have a question about something else like the resume or the letter of recommendation, 
feel free to join us. We have an Ask Admissions Anything drop-in session, super casual on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Drop in, ask us those questions there or send us an email. We'll have our contact information at the end of this presentation. And definitely sign up for those other application breakdown sessions that we've got coming up in November. We have one on November 8th that's specifically on the resume and letters of recommendation. And then a third one on December 1st to target everything else, the transcripts, the test scores, and the language requirements. So again, thanks for tuning in. We'll get started. We're gonna start with giving you a brief overview of all of the application components before we delve more deeply into the statement of purpose, the project proposal, and the writing sample. We've also pulled out three of the frequently asked questions that you submitted on your registration form. So thank you so much for taking the time to submit your questions to us. We wanna make sure we're answering what you wanna hear. And then of course, we're gonna save some time for Q&A as well for any questions that do pop up as you're listening to us. So again, please feel free to make use of that Q&A chat box. Um, so without further ado, Margaret, I say let's get started. We're also going to turn off our cameras during the presentation piece of this, but we'll be right back as soon as we hit the FAQ portion. So with that, I'm gonna turn off my camera now and we'll get started. All right, so first it's really important to provide you with an overview of our applicant application components and our timeline. And we do this on purpose because even though we're covering three particular components today, it's really important to be mindful and to remember that the admissions committee is going to be looking at the totality of your application materials and the information that you provide us with. Each component is extremely important to us because it does give us perspective and information that we wouldn't otherwise glean from just looking at a statement of purpose, for example, or from just looking at um, a writing sample. So bear in mind that each piece is really important to the admissions committee. So let's go over briefly what the application components are. The first one is the application form, and this is a form that's available directly through our website. And it's essentially just asking you some demographic background questions to get to know you a little bit. And of course, the location where you'll be uploading all of the required materials. In addition to the application form, of course, there's a statement of purpose that we'll be going into more detail just shortly. The statement of purpose, just so you know in the moment, is double spaced, a 12 size font document that is a maximum of 1,000 words. So that's around three to four pages. And again, we'll touch base on that a little bit more deeply in a moment. There's also the project proposal that is limited just to candidates who are interested in the Master of Religion and Public Life, or the MRPL. Um, candidates for the MRPL do not need to complete a statement of purpose. Instead, they complete the project proposal. Any other candidate will be submitting a statement of purpose instead. Project proposal is essentially just some prompts that we ask directly on the application form. So you will not be submitting an extra Word document or PDF document. You'll just be responding to these prompts directly on the application form. And my colleague, Margaret, will talk to you a little bit more about that in a second. In addition to the statement of purpose and the project proposal, we also ask you for a resume. And this is typically a one to two page document in which you provide us with a chronological list of your employment history, your background, any positions that have been paid or unpaid, internships, any research, publications, fellowships, scholarships, honor societies, academic prizes, extracurricular and service activities, um, volunteer service in your faith-based communities or in any other capacity, all of this is really valuable information to us. And we do ask that you keep this in a chronological list with the most recent appearing first. In addition to the resume, we do also ask for all unofficial academic transcripts from any post-secondary institution that you have attended. And this means that essentially, we want your transcripts from any college or university level school that you've attended since completing high school. And this can be a simple PDF or screenshot or anything that you've downloaded yourself through your student portal. You don't need to pay to send us any official documentation at this stage of the process. 
In addition to your transcripts, we do also ask for three letters of recommendation. And because this is a graduate program that you're applying to, we really, really strongly encourage and urge that at least two of these letters of recommendation are from an academic source, a college professor, a university professor, a seminary professor, anybody who's had you in their classroom from an academic perspective and can offer us insight into what you're like as a student so that we can envision you here in our HDS classrooms as well. And then of course we have the writing sample. This is required from every candidate to our degree programs with the exception of the special student status. And the writing sample is just an opportunity for you to submit some polished piece of writing that you've completed at some point in the past, maybe through your classes, or it can be an entirely new piece that you create for the purposes of this application. And again, my colleague Margaret will touch base with you on that a little bit more in detail in just a little Alessandra, bit. Alessandra, I just wanted to uh, chime in just for one thing, just about the letters of recommendation. For sure. those audience that might um, have more years of experience and haven't had more recent college professors or seminary um, faculty members that would be able to speak to their academic abilities. Um, I just wanted to uh, point out that you can ask somebody who you know is a in a professional capacity, but they could speak about your skills and abilities as they would like to graduate study. So any reading, writing, um, research that you may have accomplished in your professional capacity, that is somebody that you can also potentially um, ask um, for uh, a, 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 like an academic letter recommendation. And then also just wanted to say that if you are applying for the MDiv program, we do require one that is speaks to your ministerial promise. Thanks so much, Alessandra. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Margaret. Um, so in addition to those three letters of recommendation in the writing sample, we do also ask all international candidates whose native language is not English or who completed their baccalaureate or bachelor's degree at an institution where English was not the sole language of instruction to submit TOEFL or IELTS test results. And we have more detailed information on what, on what the minimum score eligibility for this would be both on the application form itself and directly on our website. So I won't go into too much detail about this. And this requirement is only for international candidates who meet those criteria. And then we do have as a requirement here, the interview. And this is a requirement because all admitted students to our degree programs or to the special student program um, will need to have received an interview. Um, and these are extended only on an invitation basis. So not every candidate who applies will be invited to interview, but it is a requirement for those admitted candidates. Now, very quickly, just to take you through our timeline, the most important thing to know here is that Harvard Divinity School does not operate on a rolling admissions basis, which means there's absolutely no pressure or rush to complete your application quickly or early. Our application did open in mid-September on September 15th, and it does close on January 6th. So you have all those months to prepare your application and submit when you are ready by our deadline at 11.59 p.m. January 6th. We are also going to be offering those interviews, which will be conducted virtually. I do wanna clarify that for sure. So there will be no in-person travel required. This will be virtual interviews that will be extended in late January, early February. And our financial aid application will also become available to all applicants starting early to mid January. And then finally, all of our admissions decisions will be released in mid March. So this is just information to help keep you on track with our application cycle for this year. Now, now that we've given you an overall um, list of the application components, I also really wanted to take the time to discuss with you our holistic approach and how we look at each of your application pieces. Holistic to us means that we're really looking at all of the application components that you submit with the understanding that each piece gives us a unique look at the skills that you bring. And that's why I mentioned that each piece is really important to us in the review process. And so one of the things that um, you should remember as you're crafting your application is that apart from what you provide to us in each of those materials, 
we have no idea who you are. We're meeting you for the very first time. And so holistic for us is really important in that we're looking for the overall context of your story, all of the information that you provide to create a cohesive narrative about who you are and about your candidacy to our programs at Harvard Divinity School. So this is just something to keep in mind. We know that you spend many hours, many weeks, maybe months even preparing for your application. And we honor that by reading each application from cover to cover multiple times and using a holistic approach. So I did wanna make sure that I touched on this before we actually now delve into more specifically the statement of purpose, the project proposal and the writing sample. So here we go. The first one that we'll be touching on today is the statement of purpose. So as I mentioned earlier, the statement of purpose is a three to four page document, about 1000 words maximum. Please don't exceed that word limit. And it's a really important piece of your application. And the reason why it's so important, it's because it's the first really opportunity for the admissions committee to meet you directly. It's the piece of your application that is fully and completely your voice. You have complete ownership of the content and of the process that you present to us. And it's an opportunity for you to tie in all of your narrative. If you think about it, a lot of the pieces of an application are prescribed for you. Your resume is that chronological list, right? Of all of your employment experiences, extracurricular activities, all of these are things that you've already done. They're in your past. You can't really change them at this point. Same thing goes with your GPA. Maybe you are a student who's already graduated and been out of college for several years, or maybe you're a junior in college now. Your first year and sophomore year grades are already set for you. You can't change them. Your letters of recommendation are written by other people. You don't really know what's going to be said about you in those letters. You certainly have an influence and you can guide your reference writers, but otherwise you're not really sure. So the statement of purpose is really unique in that ability where you take total control. And so this is where we're really looking to hear your voice and to get a sense of who you are. So this is why the statement of purpose matters. Okay, so then the big question is, what do I write about? What do I possibly choose to include in this statement of purpose? Well, first, first, it's pretty basic. On the application form, we do ask you a series of prompting questions that we would like to be addressed on that statement of purpose. So the first one of which is your background and your preparation for graduate theological study. So you are applying to a divinity school in which these are subjects that will be studied with academic rigor. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about what prepared you for this moment. What prepared you for this time in which you want to pursue graduate studies? Your background experiences are key to that. We also want to look ahead to your future. Have you thought about what you want to do with a degree from Harvard Divinity School? What are your vocational and career objectives? And then tell us why you think Harvard Divinity School is a great fit for those intended goals. Now, this is important because we're looking for you to show us to demonstrate that you really thought reflectively about this, intentionally about it. Did you do your homework on Harvard Divinity School? It would be a really great opportunity for you here to name drop professors that you've researched that you're interested in working with, um, maybe pursuing a research fellowship with. Um, look up our programs and centers. We have at least six of them. Um, do any of them align with your interests? What about classes or courses that interest you? This is a great opportunity to mention them in your statement of purpose. And then of course, we have um, program specific prompts that we would like you to address um, depending on which program you're applying to. So as Margaret mentioned earlier, for the Master of Divinity, that has a really big ministerial component. On top of just submitting a letter of recommendation that speaks to that, we also want to know what you plan to do, what your ministry is. And ministry we define very, very um, basically here. It's all encompassing. It's a lowercase m, and it's really just what service-driven work you're interested in. If you're applying to the Master of Theological Studies or the Master of Theology, we want you to tell us about which area of focus you're interested in. Harvard Divinity School has 18 to choose from, 
And if those 18 were not sufficient for you, you could also petition to study in a completely different area. And so we want to see that you've put some thought into this and that it's something you address in your statement of purpose. And then finally, if you're applying to the special student program, that's a very distinctive status because you're not a degree, um, a degree enrolled student. So we definitely want to get a sense of why you're interested in this status and what you're hoping to get from it. Okay, so apart from answering those four prompts, we typically, again, really want to get a sense of who you are. So when I'm reading an application, there are three questions that I have in my mind about you. And I'm hoping that by the time I'm done reading through your statement of purpose, reading through your entire application, I can answer all three of them. And they're right here on this application slide. So the first question is, why you? And when we ask why you, we don't mean it in the sense of, oh, uh, tell me why you're more deserving than the person next to you. That's not how we mean that question at all. What we're really trying to gauge is, again, just introduce yourself to us. Who are you? What, are, what about your background experiences? Again, delving into those four prompts that we asked you. So definitely introducing yourself to us. The second question is why Harvard Divinity School? So again, just showing us that Harvard Divinity School specifically meets your needs and interests for your future career aspirations. And then why now? And this is an important question. Why are you interested in attending Divinity School today? this fall? Why not five years ago? Or why not 10 years from now? What has led you to determine that right now is the time for you to enter Divinity School? And if you notice the four prompts that we include in the application form have a sense of movement to them. Your background pertains to your past. Your vocational or career objectives pertain to your future. And then why Harvard Divinity School is a good fit for your goals pertains to your present. So there's that sense of movement that I find helps me when thinking about the statement of purpose. All right, so what are some tips that we ultimately have for you? Well, the first of which would be show us, don't tell us. Don't forget that your statement of purpose is going to be part of the totality of your application pieces. I don't know about you, Margaret, but when I'm reading an application, I usually start with the resume first and then I move into the transcript as well as the letters of recommendation. And then I actually save the statement of purpose until the end so that I leave the applicant's voice to really tie together the whole application. And so when I say show, don't tell. Oh, she, oh Sandra, I actually do read applications the same way, which I know other <laughs> not. I do know other admissions committee readers who read statement of purpose first. But I yeah. think that leaving the good stuff for like last. That's how I operate too, so. Yeah, I, I always, I like to save the best for last. That's me too, me mind. too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things that I mean by show don't tell is don't, like I'm gonna have a lot of this contextual background at this point about, for example, your resume and your extracurricular activities and things of that nature. So when I'm reading your statement of purpose, I don't necessarily want a recitation of facts or a catalog of experiences that you've already discussed in your resume. Certainly, you can pull anecdotes and stories and experiences that help open up where your interest area lies and why you have those certain career goals. But I definitely want you to take me in a little bit. Take me into your story. Show me. Tell me how it impacted you. Discuss your feelings. Discuss the epiphanies that you had. Show me, don't necessarily give me a recitation of facts. The next and probably the most important element to remember about the statement of purpose is to be genuine and honest. Authenticity is the key here. We don't want you to write a statement of purpose that is directed toward what you think Harvard Divinity School wants to see or hear or learn about you. It's about your story. It's about who you are. And only you know what that story is. And that's what honestly makes a compelling statement of purpose, being absolutely genuine and honest. Most people don't wake up at two or three or four or five years old and say, oh yeah, I'm going to divinity school someday. Oftentimes, it's a discernment process that happens either slowly over time 
where for some applicants, it happens, boom, immediately after one experience, after one moment. And that is unique to every applicant. And so with your statement of purpose, that's what we want to gauge is your story, your background, you. And finally, of course, the statement of purpose is an example of your writing ability and skills. And so this should be a polished piece that you've spent a lot of time crafting. Feel free to reach out to peers, to mentors, to friends, give them your statement of purpose so that they can look it over and provide you with their feedback. Make sure that you have formatted it properly. There are no spelling or typing errors. Um, again, you're showing the admissions committee that you're able to undertake rigorous um, writing and reading intensive courses at Harvard Divinity School, as we are a school that focuses in on the humanities and the social sciences. Um, so that's all I've got essentially on our statement of purpose for now. Again, please feel free to use the Q&A if there were any questions that arose for you in that time. I did want to point out two resources that we do have immediately available for you, and that is our How to Apply series on our application blog, so you can find our graduate assistants from last year updated the post. Um, highly recommended if you want additional information, as well as a YouTube video on the How to Apply series, the Statement of Purpose. So feel free to go check it out. Highly recommended. All right, Whew. I've been chatting for quite a while here, so I'm gonna pass the mic on to Margaret so she can talk to you about the project proposal. Thank you so much, Alessandra. I really appreciate it. Next slide, please. I don't think I can, yeah. So the next, I'm gonna talk about the project proposal, which is the only, it's, it's um, one of the primary requirements for the Master of Religion and Public Life. Um, this is our newest master's degree program at Harvard Divinity School, and it's really, really exciting. Um, it is a one-year full-time degree program, basically for professionals in the field who are seeking to have an understanding about the intersection of how religion impacts their specific profession. Um, so they want to gain an in-depth knowledge of the complex ways religion influences public life. Um, so we have folks who are journalists or filmmakers and artists. We have um, actually uh, professors and writers and um, lots of different types of folks that are, are just really interested in exploring this area um, and the intersection. It's, it's really, really wonderful. Um, there's only, the program itself is so incredibly flexible. There's only two required co courses and one final project requirement, uh, which would require um, a presentation of that project. Next slide, please. And so since this program is um, within a nine month program, it's, it's one academic year, you're going to have to have a final project that engages in a topic of religion within that pro a profession. So within the application for admission, you will find a form that requests that you elaborate on your project idea. Uh, um, and so you'd have to discuss your intended project, the impact that you hope to achieve, listing up to three Harvard Divinity School faculty members that you, or no, actually three faculty members broadly, sorry, that you'd like as potential advisors and three resources to support the project. Obviously they should be at HDS and Harvard broadly. And then finally, what are your hopes and intentions for seeking the MRPL? Um, it's really just trying to understand what your goals are. Obviously the, the, the types of students who are in the program are coming from an, a, a dizzyingly diverse array of professions, backgrounds. And so there is no one type of there's no one, thanks so much, Alessandra, there's no one specific profile we're looking for. And that's why the program itself is just so flexible. So students are able to draw from all of the resources at Harvard Divinity School and across Harvard University and beyond in order to make their project ideas flourish and happen. Um, but that requires folks to really plan ahead. And so we ask you within the application, how would you plan your nine months at HDS? How would you make it happen? Um, and it really benefits the applicant to do that anyway, just to make sure it is actually a good fit, that you would be able to, 
find the faculty programs, centers, courses, uh, resources, network, whatever it is that you need to get what you the project you want to get going um, happen, and that it's a good fit. Um, feel free to chat into the chat box if you have any more Q and A around the project proposal. Um, and so we're going to switch now over to the writing sample. Now, again, as, as Alessandra uh, stated, the writing sample is required for all of the applicants to our degree programs, except for the special student non-degree program. Um, this is a really awesome um, and really, really helpful um, uh, for the admissions committee because it really gives them the sense of your writing research and our critical analysis. So you can choose to a, a submit an excerpt of an academic paper, perhaps you have something from your undergraduate classes in any humanities or social sciences class. Um, again, you a lot of folks aren't religious studies majors uh, in their undergraduate studies and that's totally fine. You can definitely submit a social science or humanities paper as long as it's it's sort of related to to the study of religion that we can um, sort of make an assessment. Alternatively, if you have been out in the field for a while and it's been some time, a, an adapted piece of professional writing is also absolutely acceptable. So um, I've had professional journalists submit a previous article that they had published. Um, as, as one example of something that I've seen. Um, and then finally, you know, if, if you don't have, if that doesn't apply to you, you can always write something. You know, this is an incredibly reading and writing intense program. I mean, that is the primary thing. So if something in the field really excites you, you can go ahead and write something on that. And it, frankly, it's, it, it, it if you haven't been in school for a while, it's actually a really cool opportunity to get your feet wet. And if you have been in a while, maybe it'll give your, yourself a chance to sort of dip your toes into what academic research in the study of religion would feel like. So this again, we tried not to be so prescriptive, primarily because this is honestly just to get a sense for, for the admissions committee to get a sense of how you write and how you, re, how you conduct research. Um, 1500 words is pretty limited. Oh, thanks, Alessandra. Uh, 1500 words is pretty limited. Um, and so if you are using an excerpt just, um, and you're trying to figure out which um, part of it, a longer paper you would use, I would recommend sort of the analysis part. So again, like the larger, we want to get a sense of how your critical analysis is, is um, and how your ability to write is. So, um, and then finally, again, the con, uh, so showcase your writing skills, feel free to edit an existing piece of writing, consider writing something new, and the content doesn't have to be religious or theological um, at all. It's, it's okay if it's in the humanities, um, and that's, that's totally great. The next slide um, is another awesome uh, resources for folks. If you go check out our HDS admissions blog, which I hope everybody does, um, that's a really great um, resource. We have one on the writing sample that has been updated as well, um, as well as an accompanying YouTube video, which we hope um, will be useful to folks who are hashing out what to, how to write um, about this part. Next slide. All right, so I'm going to turn my camera back on as we're going to transition to the frequently asked questions part of today's presentation. And again, a big thank you to those of you who submitted questions for us to answer. Um, the first one that we got is what makes a compelling statement of purpose? Margaret, do you have any initial impressions for that question? Um, absolutely. I think, first of all, I really liked how you wrote. Um, and the tip side, you know, authenticity is key. I think that is really important to, to just really have your own voice. Um, another thing is um, folks that really have a sense of what they want. I mean, I know oh, this is a very, un I think this is a very uncertain time and it's really, really hard to feel like, like anything is a normal thing. And so I can't imagine applying to grad school during this time, but, uh, 
but at the same time, you know, trying to give the admissions committee with a sense that you have thought through what your goals are and how you hope to use the resources of HDS in order to get to where you want to go. Um, I think those are particularly helpful. Yeah, and for me, when I look on that, when I look at that question, what makes a compelling statement of purpose? I, I want to provide some reassurance here that when we're reviewing your statement of purpose, we're not looking to be blown away by something completely unheard of that we've never read before or by some really, you know, a story of adversity that you overcame or, or something that will just completely overturn, blow our minds. This is essentially supposed to be an opportunity where we're just getting to know you, whatever story that may be, whatever background you're coming from. And so a compelling statement of purpose is simply one with which I can read, put down the paper and say, wow, I really learned a lot about this candidate. I learned a lot about their motivations for divinity school. I learned a lot about their interests in what they hope to pursue with a degree from Harvard Divinity School. Even if these are not things that actually come to pass, it's still really helpful for me to know that you put a lot of reflection into why you're applying to Harvard Divinity School to begin with. So don't focus on making this really grandiose statement of purpose. Again, as Margaret stated, authenticity is key. Just be yourself and just tell us about yourself. Um, and that takes many different forms. As I mentioned earlier, candidates to our degree programs or to the special student program come to us from so many different backgrounds. Um, and so only really, it's your story. Only you can really provide to us what that is. Just make sure that it ties all of your application pieces together so that again, it's kind of getting back to those three questions that um, I pointed to earlier. All right, so the next question that we got, what are some common pitfalls or mistakes to avoid on that statement of purpose? Um, don't use quotations, no footnotes, no photography, <laughs> no endnotes. Yeah, and I would also add, physically, <laughs> don't, don't go past the word limit. We do say three to four pages, but we do give a maximum word count of 1,000. So definitely stick to that. No photos, please. That's always great. Agree with the no footnotes or endnotes. Um, and again, don't, don't rehash your resume here. We will probably have just read it a few minutes previously to getting to the statement of purpose. Um, and yeah, that's essentially, those are some of the more common mistakes that I've noticed. Okay, do footnotes, endnotes, bibliographies, and or appendices count towards the 1500 word limit for the writing sample, Margaret? Um, so for the writing sample, please do include uh, footnotes or appendices or bibliographies. I, we don't really need all of it. We just need really a footnote and a, a bibliography or however you cite. And they do not, uh, are, they are not included in the word limit. Great. All right. So we've essentially reached the point of today's presentation where it's, it's your time. Whatever questions that you have for us. Um, and again, please, if you can keep it to the statement of purpose, the project proposal and the writing sample. Um, We'll definitely have opportunities for other questions in our future recruitment events. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here so we can all see each other. I'm really sorry, my kid is crying. I, I told my husband, I hope you can't hear it. <laughs> I, I can't hear. <laughs> okay. Okay, Margaret, so I got a question here. Oh. So should we avoid quoting anyone in our statement of purpose? What if the quote explains part of our motivations? Oh, um, look, I can't, you can, I, I don't wanna tell what anybody what to write. I think that if, if you have a quote that you feel like is meaningful to you and it makes sense into your life, I think that, and you weave it craftily into the statement of purpose, I absolutely think you can do that. 
I have just read a lot of people who think they should do something like that when it's actually not their voice, right? At the end of the day, we just want to hear your voice. We don't really need to hear anybody else's voice or a quote from somebody else. We really need to hear from the applicant. What is it that you want? Why HDS? And answering the questions that we've asked. Um, again, not being fancy, not flourishing, not really just being sort of um, just honest and just sort of true to you. Okay, is something like a legal or appellate brief too technical as an adaptive piece of professional writing? I mean, I, I can't tell you what to submit or what not to submit. I think that you just have to think about what would somebody who is, who, like, if you're, if you're applying for a graduate program in the study of religion, if you think that whatever piece you're writing is sufficient to show that you would be prepared for graduate study in religion, which is admittedly a different field, um, you might wanna consider something else. I mean, I don't know what the writing is and I can't evaluate that. So um, I, I, it's honestly, a, 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 this is one of those things the applicant has to use their best judgment. Yeah, uh, I would agree with that as well. Um, there's one on which style or format should we follow? APA Chicago or MLA, we do not care. You can do whatever you want, um, whatever makes sense to you, what, whatever you're most comfortable with. If this is for the writing sample, just essentially keep it consistent. Whatever citing citation style you do choose to use, just be consistent throughout. Is exceeding word limit by a few words acceptable? That's a great question. We're, okay, just to be clear, nobody is counting words here. We're not gonna like go word by word. We're just asking everybody, to, I guess, I mean like, cause we are a divinity school. Just like, if you, if you wouldn't mind, please like being kind to your neighbors. We ask that you follow the same rules because we wanna treat everybody the same. And so that's why we ask if please don't go over the maximum word count that we ask that you just help us out by doing that. Um, we, we're not gonna, I mean, if, if when people do go way, way beyond that, like submitting 20 page statement of purpose, single line, whatever, then I dock them points for that. Cause that's really, that's really not nice, but like, Typically, if it's just a few words over, nobody's going to pee. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you, don't, yeah. you want to take one? Can we submit a writing sample from one of our academic courses? Is it one or more samples required? So absolutely, you can submit a writing sample from one of your academic courses. Again, we're really just trying to get a sense. So the writing sample differs from the statement of purpose in that in the writing sample, it's a little bit more... Um, academic language. We're really trying to get a sense of your analytical abilities, your critical thinking skills, and how you've employed these in a professional or academic setting. So absolutely, something you wrote for a class, and you can feel free also to edit it to make it more appropriate to the application or to provide some context. So if you're taking, for example, an excerpt from a longer piece that you've written in the past, you can feel free to write a little contextual paragraph on the top so that the admissions committee knows um, kind of what your excerpt is talking about or discussing. Um, one or more samples required, just one, please. And again, keep this to 1500 words maximum. Um, so yes, if you go over a few words, that's okay. But again, we're trying to keep the process equitable as we've asked every candidate to maintain at a 1500 word limit. Um, all right. There's a great question here on common pitfalls mistakes for the writing sample. That's a great question. So um, no, not really. I mean, just, I, I would say like, again, if you just try to try to like go along with what we just sort of asked, use your best judgment, but like really just try to follow our instructions. Like if it's something from your undergrad papers 
or you write something like, um, or you write something original, it's a 1500 word requirement. So it's not particularly long. So um, hopefully between now and January 6th deadline, you could potentially write something, especially if it is something that is of interest to you um, to study. It doesn't, nobody is, and just to be clear, for both the statement of purpose and writing sample, nobody takes a look at it. And then when you, should you be a student here saying like, hey, you said this, that you wanted to do this, and now you're doing something different. Nobody ever does that. Because a lot of people do change their minds, and that's totally fine. It's more just sort of like, what is the original purpose at this moment with the information that you have, as best as you can describe what your goals are, even though they may shift potentially in the future, if that makes sense. Yeah. Margaret, can you give us any examples of MRPL projects that students submitted? That's a great question. So we can't give like very specific, but I can tell you generally speaking, like the folks that are interested in the program come from an incredibly diverse array of backgrounds. So it's, for example, if you are a journalist who is seeking to, um, you know, do a series of news articles around a re religion and some aspect of public life. You know, that is something that I have seen before. Um, alternatively, I have seen um, uh, uh, folks who are podcasters who are interested in exploring of religion and public life in politics, um, um, healthcare providers who are interested in sort of either health, ethical care or or um, or so sort of more just the intersection of religion and medicine, uh, more broadly speaking. So there's it's just like there's no one to uh, humanitarian aid workers. Um, I think I think I've seen I've seen that before. Um, at folks in education, of course. Um, so there's just a wide variety of different uh, different types of folks who have proposed different um, projects mm -hmm. related to the intersection of religion with their specific profession and how they intend to utilize the resources of HDS specifically um, in order to, you know, execute their goals. So this should be a research interest that you also have, you've thought about and reflected on for some time. And that is what has prompted you ultimately to seek an avenue for expanding and furthering that research question. And that's how you've landed, for example, at Harvard Divinity School um, through the MRPL program. So um, like Margaret said, there are so many different ways to pursue a project proposal. This is really only the second year that we're offering. It's a really new master's program. So we don't have a repertoire of you know, polished project proposals or final projects that we can give examples on. But again, it varies so much depending on what your unique interests might be and how you wanna combine that from a professional standpoint to a religious um, or theological academic standpoint as well. And again, that can be anything from a really long paper that you focus in on crafting. It can be a few, you know, two, three papers. It could be a series of articles, like Margaret mentioned, completely up to you. Great, uh, there's a very quick one. Um, should the submissions be in doc form or PDF? Uh, please submit everything into PDF. Yes, that would definitely be preferable, a PDF document. From Lisa, my undergraduate days were about 30 years ago. I will be writing something brand new. Can you recommend general topics? So, First of all, that's an excellent question and thank you for that because we certainly do get plenty of applicants who range in age. Our age range this past year was 21 years to 68 years. So we definitely had candidates joining us who've been out of school for quite, a little, quite some time. Um, you're welcome, Lisa, to consider maybe submitting something from a professional piece or anything that you've had to write. But if you do wanna craft something entirely brand new, 
talk to us about what you are passionate about, what your interests are, and show us how you've deeply reflected and thought about these topics. Show us your critical thinking skills, your analytical skills, delve more deeply into something such that you would consider putting yourself in an academic mindset. What would it look like if you had an overarching thesis and how would you substantiate that thesis? So it's again, entirely up to you what general topics you come up with. It can be theologically or religiously based. It can be um, on a hobby or an interest that you've picked up over the years. It can be on maybe what your current professional um, pursuits are and what led you to that and what you have seen develop in your field over time. It can, it can range from so many different, um, so many different topics. Just, um, I would suggest just having an overarching theme that helps guide your writing that you can then research and substantiate with facts, um, just so that we can get, again, a gauge of your academic writing and critical thinking and analytical skill. Um, Um, here's a quick one, um, or maybe not quick, but if we are coming from an acad a different academic background outside of religion, is it useful to share our motivations for our prior study and why those have shifted? Basically, we can't tell you what to write in your statement of purpose because this is your story. Honestly, however you come to the, uh, the study of religion is your story, is part of your story. If that if, if you explain, if, the, if part of that is your academic journey from your undergraduate degree to the study of religion, then you can include that. But again, that's, that's, that's again, part of it is, part of the work of creating a statement of purpose is trying to figure out what parts of my background versus my professional goals versus making the case for HDS how do I balance all of those different component parts so that it feels well balanced within the word limit? Um, and that's tough. That's not easy. And I understand that because you get a thousand words to basically write your whole life story, but um, you absolutely can do it. Um, folks have actually given me great feedback that even the process of writing their statement of purpose was in and of itself iterative and also help them discern even more that HDS was a good fit for them. Um, and so that's why I want you to take this as an opportunity to really dig deep because frankly, applying to grad school is much easier than figuring out what you wanna do, right? And so just figure, like doing that discernment, sort of trying to figure out all those component parts, um, I think is the best way to sort of manage it. Um, in terms of, if you have a question about, Oh, this is, sorry, you go ahead, Alessandra. I'm reading while I'm talking. <laughs> okay. Um, PDF for statements of purpose, writing samples, or were you referring to the project proposal? Great question. So the project proposal will be a series of prompts that you answer directly within the application form. So you won't be submitting any additional PDF or Word document for that. You'll be answering it directly on the form. The statement of purpose and the writing sample will be separate documents that you upload directly. So those would be the PDF documents. Good question. Thanks for asking. And then uh, should we name the PDF file before submission? There's no need to um, because when you submit your application, just make sure that you upload, for example, the resume on the resume page and you upload the statement of purpose on the statement of purpose page. All of that will be included within your entire application file in that order. Um, so it might be helpful to include your, your first and last name perhaps on the right header, um, but there's no need to title the PDF or anything. We'll see it within the rest of your application materials and within your file. There's a great question from a current undergrad who's in their senior year. Um, so you absolutely can apply if you are planning on graduating in May of 2022. If you are a senior in college now and you want to just go straight into uh, straight into the HDS degree, you basically just um, 
you you would apply and we would just have your in progress transcript for probably fall 21 um, with even without grades that's okay um, as long as the courses are in progress and then um, should you be admitted and choose to enroll at Harvard Divinity School we will require you to provide us with your final official transcript next year so uh, next summer uh, by July, basically, and and that final transcript has to just have your Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of degree conferred and the graduation date on it, and that's that's how college seniors are or whatever folks that are currently in degree programs are able to get in for next um, fall. Looking for any statement of purpose, um, writing sample or project proposal related questions. I do see that we have a few, but I'll save these. Um, I encourage- well, We have five minutes left. Um, so hmm. this is a good one. So um, getting a question here about how Margaret and I have been discussing that it's really important to get to know you as an applicant. And so the question is, is there a category of vulnerability that provides the most insight? Ugh. I mean, honestly, this is, this is a case by case basis. Every single statement of purpose should be unique because every single human being is unique. And so it's, it's honestly, it's hard because we want you to show us yourselves, but this is also the best version of yourself because it is an application for graduate school. So it's being able to show your authentic self, but also recognizing that it is, a, it still has to be in a professional way or approach to it. Um, Alessandra, do you wanna? Yeah, so similar to that, you don't need to feel, for example, an obligation to completely bear your soul. So each individual has a unique journey, right? So in some cases, there was a very distinctive, perhaps traumatic situation that might have led somebody to an interest in religious thought or in theological studies. And so in that case, talking about something vulnerable and sensitive is really integral to that person's story, in which case, by all means, please go for it. But maybe for someone, their pathway to divinity school hasn't quite um, necessitated such emotional uh, background. Maybe it was simply just a curiosity. And maybe this individual grew up in a religious household, meandered away from their religious tradition for whatever purpose or reason, and somehow found their way back to it. And it doesn't really involve anything that is overly sensitive. And that's also 100% okay. So. A category of vulnerability, there isn't anything you could say that's overly vulnerable or under vulnerable. It's just important, I think, to keep in mind the tone that you're using to relay whatever it is that you're discussing in that statement of purpose. So this is a graduate program that is pre preparing you for a professional pursuit. So we want to make sure that your statement of purpose is also professional in tone, but you're certainly more than welcome to discuss anything about your life story that has brought you to this point. However, sensitive, vulnerable, or TMI, too much information, um, it might be. It's completely up to you. Feel free to share it with us. Just keep in mind that tone. That's what I would say. We have two minutes left, so I definitely do want to make sure that I show you all our contact information so that in case we're not able to get to your questions, you can feel free to email us about it. And again, sign up for our virtual recruitment events that focus in on some of these questions that you targeted, like the resume or transcripts. So let me go ahead and share my screen really quickly, just so that you can see our contact information page. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. I hope that you know that we have a, a lot of other events happening. Uh, I know I'm going to be kept quite busy over the next uh, months and, and weeks and days. Um, 
Uh, just to shout out that on Tuesday, November 9th, we've got our open house for prospective students scheduled. Uh, regardless of whether you're actually able to join us on the day or not, we do offer the ability to get recordings and sign up for stuff. So please definitely go back to our website and check us out. Also, the HDS admissions blog and our Instagram are both fantastic ways to learn more about our community as well as the application process. Thank you all for joining us. It was such a pleasure to hear from you, especially to gauge where you're tuning in from. Um, it was really, really great. And thank you again for your thoughtful questions. You're not alone in this process or in this journey, truly. If there are still any lingering questions that you have, or if you really wanna delve a little bit more deeply into your specific situation, drop in to those Ask Me Anythings that we have coming up email us, we're here for you, and we're gonna be drafting new blog content as well to, to um, support you. So um, we're definitely approachable and we love interacting with you and we really enjoy reading your applications and we wanna make sure that you feel supported and that you feel confident you deserve to apply. Um, and so thank you again for joining us and we hope this was helpful. And I hope you have a wonderful evening, afternoon, morning, wherever it is you're tuning in from. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great one.